I never forget that it's always an honour and privilege to be up here on this pulpit. Um, and I know if I can speak for all the men that come up here that um, we never take that for granted. Uh, so if there's anything that is raised this morning that you want to discuss after or more so in the coming weeks when you see me, by all means do. For none of us up here are above any of you. We're all, we're all the same. Which is what more or less is the topic I'm speaking on which came to me uh, in the leading weeks is the race that's set before us because we're all running that race. It's a, a flow on from what I spoke about a couple of weeks ago which was about the significance of the ascension and we're all running that race and it's uh, what was given to the disciples once they saw him ascend into heaven in the clouds. You know, the race that was set before them is the same race that we've got to run. So our uh, leading scripture that we'll be going to is Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. So as you're turning to that, I'll just open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that it's only through the coming of your Son by which this word could be delivered. He exited his throne to only come down and it was only the veil of his flesh that covered his glory. And we're here to listen to his word this morning, delivered by the Holy Spirit, not my words, but for the glorification of your Son. So we know how to continue and to endure in that race that is set before us with all patience and endurance right to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the attributes of anyone who enters and wishes to compete and complete the race is faith, holiness, patience and endurance. As I just stated before, the message I, that came to me was a, a direct follow-up on the message of the Ascension to remind us of what we're called for. It's till the end and how Scripture informs us from the Old and New Testament to be open to the Holy Spirit, to read his word, to be ready to give an answer, to provide godly edification, be of good conscience, wage the good warfare and guard what we've learnt. And we'll focus on that from the exhortations of Christ that he gave to his disciples who not only warned but comforted his disciples, how Paul particularly implored and comforted and encouraged Timothy and also about the, from the context of the author of the Hebrews, how he warns, reminds, admonishes and gives the implicit necessity, necessity for discernment and, and many other traits. So that same spirit is speaking to us, us as believers, no different to them after the ascension. We're speaking of the risen, the crucified, risen and ascended Christ in whom we are waiting for his, his return and we want to know how to make him effectual in our lives and to pass that on to others. We want to make him known. So let's turn to 1 Timothy, speaking on that, turn to 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 10 to 16. So in this section here, this is very succinct. I was very drawn to this one because it's what, it's what to expect as a guidebook. It was like a guidebook that, uh, remember, Timothy was the young protege of, of Paul and he, he leaned on him particularly towards the end of Paul's ministry because of his imprisonments. So he's giving this guidebook on how to run the race to Timothy. So starting from verse 10. For to this end we both labour and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially of those who believe. 
These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So you can see that really is a very succinct guidebook given to Timothy, all in those few passages. He's warning him that he's going to, it's going to be a labour. He's going to suffer reproach in verse 10. Um, it's, and it's going to those especially who are the believers in God. It's going to come to you, Timothy. These things I command and teach to you. Don't be worried about the fact that your, that your youth might come against you. It's, that's got nothing to do with it. You ought to be an example to the believers and show that by your conduct, by your love, by your purity, by your faith and the spirit in which you deliver the word and give your self time to give exhortation to the doctrine. Make sure you read the words. So see how Paul's doing this constant encouragement to make sure he's not going to slip and fall back and, and fall away from the race himself excellent piece of passage there that he's given to, to Timothy. So you recall in the last message of the significance of the ascension, it was to bring that um, re remembrance to the return of um, the human nature that Christ had, but then returning into heaven in glory. It was a ne very necessi necessity that was required that the disciples actually saw, as I spoke last time I was here, that they actually saw him rise up in the clouds into heaven. He didn't just disappear, it was something that they actually visually saw. But the preliminary mission of that was so that the Holy Spirit could also come and deliver the message to them and they would have no fear. So his loss, it, it was not going to be a loss, but it was in fact going to be a gain. And he told them all these things and the ascension ratified everything he achieved on earth and now to be glorified at the right hand of the Father. So the disciples were now entrusted, the deliverers of his gospel. And between that and the discourse that Jesus gave to them in John chapter 15, on how the world's hatred towards them, this was a big warning he was going to give them, that immediately after the ascension, even though you'll be emboldened with the word of God through the Holy Spirit, the world's hatred is going to come to, onto you like a force that you have never seen before. Remember, and Jesus reminded them in Luke, don't have to turn here, but in, in Luke 24, 44, he said, These are the words which I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that all the things that must be fulfilled which were written in the laws of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend these scriptures and he reminded them, and you were witnesses of all these things. And, and we're no different to that today. Even though we didn't physically see it, we understand through the Holy Spirit that these things are true and did happen. So as the fall of the first man was the fall of the enemy's descendants, so the ascension of the Son of God would be the ascension of all who were grafted upon him. His atoning death was the, atoning, was the condition of receiving the Spirit of God. If he did not go away, nothing would be done. The Jews would remain as they were. The heathen would remain in their blindness. And all would be under sin and death. So his continued presence on earth would mean just a localised presence. The descending of the Spirit would mean that he could be in the midst of all men who would be incorporated into him. He sent his spirit because of the obedience to the Father so that they and we as believers would receive the spirit in obedience to him. God dwelt in the temple of Jerusalem or 
as, as we know, he dwelt wherever his holiness was. He wasn't confined to the temple, as we know from the burning bush. You are standing on a holy place. Wherever God chose to be was a holy place. However, the, the Jews built that temple under the instruction of the Lord and where to build it. And in the last two chapters of Exodus, 18 times the expression had been used that was all was done in the Lord and as he had commanded them. So now as the ascended Christ has made our human bodies the temples of the Holy Spirit, he too laid down the foundation that we obey his commandments and Peter himself, so immediately after the ascension, would speak about this in Pentecost, at Pentecost. You don't have to turn there, but we see that Peter immediately says this in Acts 2, verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out, which you now see and hear. Jesus, uh, Peter himself was admonishing these aren't my words, these are the words coming now directly from the Holy Spirit. You didn't see me with confidence when Christ was here and in your presence. I was only but behind him, but now the Holy Spirit has emboldened me and I can stand in front of you purely because of what the Spirit speaks to me. So the Holy Spirit induces that boldness, but the race for us is not about set before us is for a crown that does not perish. And that's what the disciples understood immediately. They, exu they exuded this and their light, the New Testament writers exhorted that our lives should also bring about holiness, which is what I was said at the start, an important attribute for those of us who are going to run the race. Holiness, it's like salt, really. If it is has any usefulness to others, it's got to begin with self. If Christians are no different in their thoughts, their values, their recreations, their judgments, their politics even, their business methods, any, if they're no different to the non-Christians, how can the latter inspire which he has not? Hebrews 14.12 states, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. The author is reminding the Hebrew congregation that in their conflict with the world, it's not to be at the sacrifice of holiness. But I'll get you now to turn to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 21 to 23. Still speaking on holiness. So starting from verse 21. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have the fruit to holiness and the everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul uses this human analogy of slavery in appealing for holiness. In doing so, he reminds us of the contrast between our old unregenerate life and the, our new regenerate life under Christ. Being a slave of sin is to bend oneself to a process of moral deterioration that has death unto its end. But, be, but to be a slave to God means that we're going to devote ourselves to changing to a form to holiness and a, ro a road that leads to everlasting life and ultimately to the crown that we're all pursuing, the imperishable crown. So only the wise man in this context, only a wise man can impart wisdom to others. So in the same way for us in our lives, only the saintly can, can communicate sanctity. Your example, my example, our example, our conduct in front of the world should be the example of Christ. As what Jesus stated, 
when he came, how the world's going to approach that. In John 15, if we turn there, John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. This is the warning that Christ was giving his disciples in the lead up to the, um, to the cross. So John 15, starting at verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. As we know from the events that are happening in the world, that are happening so fast, it sits in our conversations a lot between us, all of us. Not only the world talking about it, but we as Christians knowing what's taking place and having our eyes open to it. And we know from conversations that we hear within the world that the world loves the worldly. But to preserve its codes and its practices and its ideologies, it must hate the unworldly or the divine. If a man is wholly bad, he will hate holiness and he will seek to kill it or else, or at least ridicule it like Herod did. Today the ridicule continues against him who was righteous. So to continue by his example, expect ridicule. No one hates Buddha because he's dead. But hatred against Christ lives on because he lives. If the disciples or any of his followers to, were to join into the pagan cults of the day, would they find themselves hated, honestly? No. Or for us today, if we were to be any part of the following, pro-LGBT, pro-abortion, pro-climate change, pro-Biden, in other words, a Trump hater, would we find ourselves hated? No, because we're all following the world. For the world knows its own. But if we are one that follows Christ and his commandments, would you be hated? If it's by today's Marxist non-gender climate change type moral code, Yes, you would. Jesus, as it said in the scripture just there before, Jesus warned, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I just uh, recalled when I was just speaking about, mentioning Trump there before, um, I remember I mentioned it to Brian, it was probably way back in September, where I was in a, just a trinket gift shop and uh, in local Sanford and I just spotted on the shelf. I was having a chat with the storekeeper there and I was, um, just saw on the shelf there was a, a roll of, in a box of uh, Trump toilet paper with his face imprinted on the toilet paper. And I went to, in the conversation with the uh, storekeeper, I asked him, you know, did he have a roll of Biden toilet paper? But um, I don't think he appreciated that too well with the response I got. <laughs> no response, in other words. I only said it as a joke, but I don't think he liked the joke. So prior to the ascension, the disciples could understand this hate. They could not understand the hate prior to the ascension. But even after the resurrection, they, they still did not have an understanding of it. They were, were not yet maltreated. They were free to go back to their boats and nets. They hadn't experienced what hate, the world's hatred was yet. Once he ascended into heaven, once Christ ascended to, into a heaven, of which they were witnesses, it was then they ex experienced the full malignity of the world's hate. If we turn to James 4, verse 4, turn to the book of James. So James, who heard these words from the Last Supper, that, that discourse from John 15, James then would later repeat them from his own personal experience and knowledge. James, 4 verse, James chapter 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world 
makes himself an enemy of God. And don't we know it? If we take a biblical moral stance with family or work colleagues, if we even speak a different opinion, I find, these days, or offer an alternative to the media-inspired logic that's out there to what is the new moralities, well, they're close, I know the responses I get, they're close to dumbfounded. How can... How can you still believe in what's almost been totally achieved in being eradicated? Where now, it has, we know we can see from that the way of the world's thinking, it has truly come to pass. What was once call, called good is now called evil. And what was once called evil is now good. is happening in the midst of us. Let's turn to... First Peter, we're going to find an answer how to live in this world then. First Peter chapter 2. Peter implores in, in these verses, in this section, First Peter verses uh, one, 11 and 12. First Peter 2, 11 and 12. So he's giving us an answer here how to live in this world. Peter implores us to be sojourners and pilgrims. So from verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honourable amongst the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of his visitation. So, the answer doesn't continue there. Just flick over a couple of pages. Just flick over to 1 Peter in chapter 5, verse 4. So the answer is still going here. So, if we're all there, so as it, he says, so we can glorify by our conduct, glorify God in the day of his visitation. So, when the chief shepherd appears, you will, will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. In fact, if you read all of chapter 5, its advice and due instruction is on how to keep the world and its influences at bay. You know, even just casting your as I'm talking now, just casting your eyes, you can see it for yourself. As it says there in verse 6, uh, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves. Keep casting your eyes down that he may exalt you in due time. Cast your cares on him. Resist the devil, which is said in James um, chapter 4, verse 7 as well, and remain steadfast in, in your faith, in the faith. So see how this, as it keeps flowing, Peter here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is giving us that due advice on how to partake, still live in the world, but be sojourners and pilgrims, and telling us how to deal with these, the, the um, persecution that comes against us. So the world's very sense of guilt that such people would feel like the ones that we may speak with, the self-righteous that we see out there in the protests, that sort of guilt that they feel even they would before the personage of Christ is but a reflection of their self-condemnation in the face of holiness. If a thing reflects no light, it's black. If it reflects some light, it might be red, blue, or green. If it reflects all the colours, it is white. And it's probably the reason why the saints in heaven are pictured as wearing white robes. When we think about it, what are we doing? What's the saints doing? We're just reflecting the glory of Christ. makes sense, doesn't it? He's the light after all. And we're only reflecting his holiness. Our Lord gave no hope of converting everyone in the world. 
The masses are more won by the spirit of the world than by him. To share his life is to share his faith. The world would hate his followers, not because of evil in their lives, but they would hate us like the disciples because of the, what should be the absence of evil in the believers' lives, or quite simply, their goodness. Goodness does not in itself cause hatred. It's, uh, it gives hatred an occasion, though, to manifest itself. We saw this manifest in the U.S. last year, and as we all saw, and, and to our own amazement, it went on for months on end, and even extended to other parts of the world. <clears throat> in October in Portland, Oregon, during the relentless left-wing riots, their hatred was demonstrated to the point of attacking federal court buildings, and they staged street burnings of the Bible together with the American flag. I don't know if any of you saw that, but I saw that for myself. <clears throat> It was a modern type of exhibition of crucifying and denigrating. Basically, by doing that to the Bible, denigrating perfect in innocence of Christ. In a world where evil is reflected back to them as just normal or justified. And so in this act, they were believing they were doing away with what was the perceived source of the so-called injustices that they were protesting about. But this is no surprise to us in these times before the imminent return of our Lord. As it states in the verses in Romans 1, 28 and 32, the world at most have become haters of God and those who follow him. So we're not just to cast them off though. You know, if we do come in conversation with them, give opportunity on courage, give opportunity for them to hear as any of those occasion arises. Or as it says, you know, it, it's the word of the Lord that has that power to change. For as it says in Colossians 1.28, it's him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. It's his word that will change their heart. We're only to serve it to deliver it. Certainly someone from <clears throat> recent history of a book I'm reading at the moment, uh, William Carey, uh, a Baptist Englishman from 1761 to 1834. He understood this, um, that even before going to India, when he left England in, uh, just at the turn of the century, he knew that nothing but the gospel could dispel the social darkness that existed in India. Carey knew that the gospel to be the only effective antidote to social evils. The conviction sustained Cherry's chief labour, and that was to make the Bible available to the Indian masses in all their own languages. He achieved this by converting the Bible in 10 dialects and smaller versions of the Bible into 23 other languages. He believed the real battle was for the soul and the mind. He knew that false beliefs led to wrong behaviour and a harmful culture. And India had a lot of them, still does, but Carey at that time witnessed them for himself. For example, the practice of widow burning was called sati. But through him being a voice protesting against it, on December 4, 1829, he with some other English uh, missionaries that were there achieved in abolishing the practice of sati by Regulation 17 of the Bengal Code. Praise the Lord. So Carey strove to fill the Indian mind with the truth of God's word. And by that he understood it was through conversion. Because that was the cornerstone he understood of civilizing a nation. It's what civilized the West. It was once understood and recognized even by our nation. Quoted by one of our early parliamentarians, Henry Parks, who was a five-time Premier of New South Wales. This was quoted from the Sydney Morning Herald, 26th of August, 1885, saying, quote, we are preeminently a Christian people, as our laws, our whole system of jurisprudence, our constitution, 
are based upon and interwoven with our Christian belief. However, the West has mainly now lost this, and it's a great loss, but not to us who have been enlightened and can still speak that word out there, still run that race. For we've been enlightened with the full knowledge of the truth, as it says from Hebrews 10.26. And in Hebrews, which I'm going to spend a little, bit, a little bit of time on now, the book of Hebrews is such that it alternates between exalting Jesus and exhorting the congregation in the practice of sound doctrine, faith and patient endurance. In no other book does exhortation play such a large role and gives such respect as similar to what um, is done in Deuteronomy, in fact. In the face of peril of subsequently coming short of the promised rest, the author of Hebrews was explaining to them that not to follow into the footsteps of Israel and their unbelief, which he explains in chapter 3, verse 16, and chapter 4, verse 13. The congregation is reminded, is instructed to keep holding fast their present confession of faith and to keep on coming to the throne of grace in confident faith in chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. So it becomes clear when you're reading these first chapters of, of Hebrews by the number of exhortations, it was actually 22 times, in fact, in those early ch chapters of Hebrews, 22 times that the congregation um, was reminded of to keep holding fast to their faith. Because in the he Hebrews we see that that church, or that the group of believers there, had not merely failed to grow uh, in their Christian lives, but it was beginning to de degenerate. And de degenerating to the point they were be becoming spiritual infants again. If you, you've got your finger in Hebrews, uh, the writer even says that directly in chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, where he says, and it's become hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you come to need milk and not solid food. So any emphasis on going towards spiritual maturity to the Hebrews as a congregation, you can see, has now become secondary. The author of Hebrews has got to remind them of who they are in Christ and to how to hold to the faith because the, there was the genuine fear that they were on the precipice of turning uh, turning their backs on the Lord. So the, his burden in the writer's exhortation is to reinf reaffirm, to hold fast to confession of their hope as their, uh, Jesus, their only saviour, and quote, the source of eternal salvation unto all who obey him. So countless sermons have been preached on the familiar exhortation of this sermon's theme that is speaking now, verses, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, to run with patience the race that's set before us. However, it, it always seems as a call to faithful endeavour towards spiritual maturity and attainment. It's, it's got nothing to do with the question of salvation. So we're called for that to go on to that maturity and attainment. So in our walk, those that the, the world can see by our own walk, that they're inspired by us. They might revile us, they might try and ridicule us, but they're actually, deep down, they're inspired. For we know, we've, hopefully all of us have gone through, we don't require that milk anymore. That the race that we're in now, that all of us should be in now, that race to be run, it's the lifelong, it's the lifelong trial of our faith and we know in that lifelong trial it comes through constant temptation of what the world throws at us constantly and there's always that temptation in a human perspective to turn back, to, to abandon that pilgrimage, to not to be a sojourner or pilgrim anymore. And we all know, don't we, I think we all can speak of people in our lives that we've come across 
who are no longer uh, at that pilgrim and have a been in the race. For those that are sitting here, I'm sure you could all speak of someone that you've come across in your life that have now don't walk that pilgrimage anymore. And that's why the writer then continues that citation of the faithful. He's reminding this, the Hebrew congregation in the, in the days of old in chapter 11. These all obtained a good report for their faith. So he's giving that encouragement. That faith believed God for the things as yet not seen, but hoped for. So he's reminding me, reminding the congregation, that's what faith's about. Things that are not seen, but are hoped for, as when... Christ said when he ascended, you know, my local presence isn't here anymore and this is where you exercise faith. But now, compared to in their days of pilgrimage, they received not the promise like we do, but it is with patient endurance and the enduring faith that finished their race despite the trials and testings. Therefore, the exhortation to run with patience the race set before us is an exhortation to continue in the faith despite manifold temptations and to turn aside and fall away. Prominent among the men of enduring faith that was cited in chapter 11 is Abraham. I think we all know this part in chapter 11 of Hebrews, who at God's call... He went out not knowing whither he went and the writer advocates to his to be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises that comes from Hebrews 6 verses 11 and 12 to be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he declares it was only after Abraham had patiently endured long after the promise was first announced to him that then in verse 15 he obtained that promise. Hebrews 10 verse 38 states that the just shall live by faith. That's another guide for us. That's how we endure the race. It's a divine maxim affirmed four times in scripture and it's also a cardinal axiom governing man's relation to God and he's saving grace throughout his earthly experience. Just want to mention a, um, when it comes to a, a place of faith, I know we all have our own personal experiences, but um, just when I was putting this together, it, it also made me think of a, uh, there was a program that uh, Lisa and I were watching, uh, basically like a survivor type program where uh, men and women are put at their extreme in, in locations around the world. It normally involves um, being placed in a, in a jungle or a, or a desert type situation and they have nothing. They have to survive by building their own shelters, finding the water, finding their own food and it is hard. It is, it is extreme. And there was this particular episode, I think there was about uh, 40 of them in total but they're all separated into groups and um, there was this group of men just separated themselves into three and they were, it was in Colombia and they had to um, just, you've got to appreciate, they're, they're, it's into like, they've got to survive 40 days like this and it gets to the point where they're starving. They're just eating like insects and tiny little fish and it's, you can see they're struggling. Anyway, these three men, one of them being Christian, um, they, they got to a place in Colombia where uh, it was near this big lake and part of the lake was very shallow and believe it or not uh, in this lake were electric eels and uh, the Christian man had fashioned himself a, a spear and um, he had prayed to the Lord about providing for his fellow uh, contestants and with one shot uh, throwing that spear he saw this electric eel come in the, the very low water and with one, his first spear throw, he got the electric eel sort of right behind the head. But it didn't stop there because this eel was about two or three metres long and quite wide. And uh, he had to call for the other men's help. And each one of them went into the water and they, you could see they got an electric shock. They were apparently when you get stung or hit by an electric eel, it's like getting kicked in the chest by a horse. 
And you could see these men revile backwards um, when they went in to try and play their role in capturing the seal. But the main port, the point of what I was trying to say here in relation to faith is that they caught this eel and you've got a picture they haven't eaten for days, uh, losing weight and they're str struggling in their own mind. And here they are waiting, got this electric eel all getting cooked up with their um, green mango and an electric eel shish kebab above the fire and they're sitting there waiting as it's cooking and just as they're about to probably take that first mouthful, in walk 10 people from the part of the contestants and they'd been walking all day, hadn't eaten and they were starving. So as I said to Lisa at the time, what would you do? Or all you want to do is eat, you are starving as well and 10 people walk in and as I said to Lisa, I think that's come from the Lord because that Christian man was obliged to share the meal. And then it happened a second time, a second time, and you actually see it on the program, the man is on uh, many days pass and he's on bended knee and he's praying to the Lord for him to be a provider, to provide for the people. And lo and behold, he went to the same place at, at that lake and along comes an electric eel and he, he speared, once again, first shot, speared the eel again and he provided even though the other contestants tried to catch an eel in between time they, they were unsuccessful and got big electric bolts um, this Christian man got on his knees prayed to be the provider and the Lord provided and um, he was able to provide to the other contestants I think it was a true testament to uh, to his faith and how uh, in that trial he also had to learn to share what he was given, just as Christ had share, has shared with us his glorious uh, eternal life gift. So faith had to be exercised, even if we go back to the beginning, faith had to be exercised by Adam, because faith in the word of his creator concerning a death he neither had experienced or observed was the one condition whereby if he had avoided that death, if he had held on to God's word, he could have continued to share an eternal life with God. So Adam and Eve, after the fall, were to exercise faith in the word of God who had promised a coming redeemer. And they did this through God's ordinance of the animal sacrifice as the approved approach to a merciful God for guilty sinners. It was now set forth, that was the condition whereby fallen men could know forgiveness and saving grace. It was by faith and not by chance that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. And that was all then explained by the author of Hebrews for the other patriarchs of chapter 11 and all the Old Testament prophets, that it was now had to be lived out by them, that the just should live by faith. Let's turn to Hebrews, since we're in Hebrews, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 verse 35 to 38. So in the present era in our lifetime, it's still the, it's still the principle that governs man's participation in the eternal life of God in Christ. From verse 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward, well, you need, you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So we can see from those verses how essential it is then that we run with patient endurance, the race set before us. It's a burden shared by all the New Testament writers and by our Saviour himself. All exhort and admonish in their letters with, the, with that same theme that it twine, entwines them together is that there must be an indwelling of the Holy Spirit 
enabling all to be faithful to the gospel, to safeguard its purity, to be sound in doctrine, to acknowledge that you will suffer, you will have temptation, you will be persecuted, you'll be reviled, and perhaps even imprisoned, but continue in the faith, persevere for a crown awaits those who endure to the end. If we turn to James 1, verses 12, So we're just going to cover a few scriptures that's on that same vein. How the New Testament writers are all, as I just said, how they all entwine together, reminding, all written at different times, but all saying the same thing, that we're to run that race. James 1 and 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And similar are the words from Revelation 2, verses 10. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into the prison that you may be tested, and you'll have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. We turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is a, a, also an excellent discourse of advice and encouragement to us from Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Chiming in on the spirit with um, the other New Testament writers. From verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Remember that was just said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. We're achieving, trying to achieve an imperishable crown. From verse 26, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subje subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So if we compare the admonishment Paul gives Timothy in his two letters, you know, just reading the two letters of Timothy, it is just wonderful ad ad exhortation and an encouragement that he gives. But if we compare that, we we're just talking about what the state of the congregation of Hebrews, but you compare it now to the advancement of how Paul's admonishing Timothy. You can see Paul's epistles here are more or less, as I mentioned at the start, they're like a, a handbook, a guidebook for young ministers of the gospel. That's why I encourage they're such good reading for us in running the race. Timothy was one who was entrusted by Paul to guard the gospel, guard it like a sacred deposit committed to them, who was faithful to proclaim it, who was ready to suffer for it. This is what he's trying to get through to Paul. It's a precious gift and is faithful to pass it on to the other followers. He was commended to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince rebuke, exhort, and with all long-suffering and teaching. Just turn to um, uh, it's 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's right at the very end. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. I was really taken by this because it's, um, it really sums up the whole epistle, or both epistles. And it, we've got to recall it was written at a time when this is uh, Paul's second imprisonment. His first imprisonment, he had a bit of freedom, but here in his second imprisonment, he was in chains. So we're reading from verse 21. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed 
concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. They're the final words of, of um, that letter. And you can see the emotion that's attached to it. See how he writes it. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. It's a precious thing. And I'm leaving it with you. I'm imprisoned and my death is near. And I, Do you understand how precious this is? Take it with you. Hold on to it. Don't be drawn away by the profane and idle babblings. Isn't that what we've got today? Isn't that what a wonderful sentence this is as a last encouragement? Don't be caught up in contradictions of what's falsely called knowledge. Isn't that what is happening today? The whole um, push for knowledge. I think it was spoken up here by Brett Big just the other couple of weeks ago. What we think is knowledge and everyone's knowledgeable. Look at this in the last sentence of Timothy. Paul's pointing it out. Don't be caught up in this. It's just babblings. It's this, Timothy. Oh, Timothy, guard this. Guard the gospel. That's what is important. And by, by getting caught up in knowledge, people professing it, see there in that last sentence, some have strayed. It, it made people, you know, people get young. You go to university... And off you go. You think you're knowledgeable. You've strayed concerning the faith. I just was really taken by that last scripture. I think it really shows Paul pouring his heart out, but it's, it's for us today. It's the climate's no different. And also, in the final words of what a true worker of the gospel, we would hope that we could all say, of one who ran the race set before him, just look, go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. You can see Paul pouring his heart out here again, imploring Timothy to, to continue to run that race because here I am at the end. Chapter 4, uh, verse 7 and 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Don't we all want that imperishable crown? Don't we all would like to have that last testimony? Don't we all want to see Jesus? Our Lord's solemn words in John 15 that one we all know, don't have to turn there, we all know that discourse from verses 1 to 14. It's where he speaks, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. It clearly depicts that when Jesus also given that solemn warning and encouragement, that urgent necessity and importance of perseverance, of endurance. Our Lord explains the significance of our life relationship should always be engrafted and attached to the vine no matter where we are in life. I pray that we all stay attached to that line and not draw back. As Paul reminded Timothy, the reward of that perseverance, which is still in, in 2 Timothy 2 verses 12, if we endure, this is, part of the re this is the reward, if we endure, we will also reign with him. So finally, let's turn to the, uh, the supreme example of who, the one that ran that race with patience and endurance, of the one, of the race that was set before him, the perfect example being Jesus, who in the days of his flesh gave us the eternal life lesson in, in that, what we started this speaking today in verse 2 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right-hand throne of God. Lord, we thank you this morning for this word. We thank you that... 
we will endure this race for you are truly worthy. We are not ashamed of the, the testimony of, of you, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. No matter what comes before us in our life, Lord, we will continue that race for we know that crown is a worthy crown, not one that the world sets before us, the one that's perishable, but the imperishable one that you deliver unto us. So we wait for your glorious appearing, Lord. We know that when your glorious appearing comes that we will all rejoice. Heaven will all rejoice and we will rejoice. And know that that race that we've taken through life, every part, every single part of it was worth it for the love of the Lord and the glory of his Son. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.